Hey, good morning, church family. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Woo! We are glad that you're here today. If you've got your Bibles, I want you to turn to the book of 1 John. Some of you have got your Bible. Some of you have got your Holy Mobile with you. And if you could take that Bible app, you take it to 1 John. There is a John, but we're not going there. We're going 1 John. It's an epistle, and if you're opening your Bibles on the far right. So it's 1 John, and we're looking at chapter 5. For two months, we have been walking through this book of 1 John. And bottom line is, this book is about a church that has gotten off track. And they've gotten off track in both their belief and in their behavior. And what John is trying to do is to help to get them back on track. Well, this week, I thought I'd look up that definition. What does it mean to get off track? And here's the definition. Someone who's not moving forward properly or who is not going in the right direction. Not moving forward properly, are not going in the right direction. It was just last month, March 26th, a British Airways uh, 3271 flight out of London City. And its destination was, well, depends who you ask. The passengers all bought tickets to go to Dusseldorf, Germany. And they all got on the plane excited that they were getting ready to head to Dusseldorf, Germany. However, the pilot, the flight crew, and air traffic controllers had a different plan. And they took off, and as they took off, it was an interesting flight at first, but then it began to get a little tense when people realized we're heading in a different direction. And sure enough, they landed in Edinburgh, Scotland, which is 520 miles away from Dusseldorf, Germany. What had happened is there was no safety issue. They just got the wrong plan, and they went in the wrong direction. Now, today I'm thinking thinking about that and saying, where are you? There's some of you that are here today that are saying, you know, when you think about being on track, heading in the right direction, I just got to be straight with you. I feel like that I'm not quite on the tracks. I need to get back on the tracks. There's some of you today that said, hey, I've never been on the tracks. And then there's some of you that say, I don't even know what you're talking about. About what tracks? What other tracks? Well, the good news is, is the passage of Scripture we're going to read today is going to encompass all of us. And we're going to determine what these tracks are, how to get on these tracks. And if you hadn't been on them, you can get back on these particular tracks. And what are the tracks? The tracks are having a relationship with Jesus Christ. And how can we get on that track. Now, if you've got your Bible, I want you to open to 1 John chapter 5, and I want to read through verses 1 through 12, and let's just set the stage for what we'll share today. Because what we want to talk to you about today is how do we get back on track to have a victorious living, the living that God has called us to have. It says right here, starting in the first verse, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, Not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater, for this is the testimony of God that he has borne concerning his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his son. And this is the testimony, that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. Tracks. Let's get back on the right track. Okay, so tell me what the tract is. Well, the tract is having a relationship with God. So the first thing that we need to deal with is this, and that is that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus himself 
claim that he was the Son of God. Now, in the Jewish law, in which Jesus was growing up during that time, in which the people who were there surrounding him knew, the Jewish law said that in order for a testimony to be true, you had to have at least two witnesses to confirm it. And the writer of this book, John, says, tell you what, I'll do one better. I'll give you three witnesses. There are three witnesses that say that Jesus is the Son of God. The first one, he said, is by water. And the water is baptism. The first testimony is water, which is baptism. The testimony of his baptism. When Jesus was initiating his ministry, he's about 30 years of age, he came down to the Jordan River. A man by the name of John the Baptist took him into the river and he baptized him in obedience to what God had asked him to do. But something special happened during that baptism. As soon as Jesus came out of the water, it said it's almost as if the heavens opened and there was a voice from heaven that said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. God himself spoke out and identified his son and says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And then it said that the Holy Spirit descended on him even as a dove. So right there, there was a testimony on his baptism. But the second thing he said, there was a testimony of blood. Testimony of blood takes you all the way to the crucifixion. And after about three and a half years of ministry, then Jesus went to a cross to be crucified. And as he goes to this cross to be crucified, there were some supernatural things that took place during those six hours in which he was suspended between heaven and earth. Because during that time, as he was hanging on the cross, dying for our sins, it says that there was a supernatural darkness that began to take over the area right in the middle of the day. It also said that there were some earthquakes that began to take place. And then the one that really blows your mind, it talked about that the veil of the temple was torn in two. You say, whoa, 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 why is that so big? Listen to this. Temple was huge, okay? And there was this veil of the temple that, that separated two areas of the temple. One of the areas was called the Holy of Holies. And it is where the presence of God would reside. It is where people would come and, and they could only come one day a year. And it was the, the high priest. And one day a year he could step behind the veil of that temple. And, and as he would step behind the veil, he would stand in the Holy of Holies and he would make sacrifices for the people of Israel and for their sins. And so this veil that separated man from God was always there. And it was huge. It was 60 feet high, and it was 30 feet wide, and it was about four inches thick. And some say it weighed over hundreds, maybe even a thousand pounds, this heavy veil. As soon as Jesus was crucified, and it talked about the darkness came, the earthquake came, it says that the veil of the temple was torn from the top all the way to the bottom, just ripped open. And when it was ripped open, all of a sudden, it opened up a way for man to have direct relationship with God. No longer did they have to go through a priest or anyone else. Now they could go through Jesus Christ the Son because he had paid the sacrifice. And so in his death, in the shedding of his blood, it was a testimony that he was the Son of God. But then John said there's a third testimony, and that's the Spirit. And he says the Spirit, and that's the Holy Spirit that lives within us. And what the Holy Spirit is, it's that voice of truth. It's that internal assurance that lets us know, yes, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. In fact, Jesus said this in John 15, 26. And in John 15, 26, he says, the Holy Spirit will bear witness about me. The Holy Spirit will bear witness about me. And so Jesus already said, listen, there's going to come a time when God's Spirit itself will bear witness about who I am. So you've got the testimony, the testimony of the water, the baptism, testimony of the blood, crucifixion, the testimony of the Spirit. And so with all these testimonies, I love what he says in verse 9. Look what he says in verse 9. He says in verse 9, if we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he is born concerning his son. You got testimony of men, you got testimony of God. You have people who will sit there and tell you, I just don't think Jesus is the son of God. I don't think he's, he's, he's deity. I don't think he's divinity. And then you've got God saying, yes, he is my son. And yes, he is deity. And yes, he is God. So who are you going to listen to? I got to tell you, personally, I'm leaning towards God on this one uh, on there. And that's what he's saying. You get testimony of men, you got testimony of God. And so Jesus is the Son of God. That's what the tracks are. You say, okay, if that's what the tracks, how do I get on the tracks? Well, how you get on the tracks is the second point, and that is we are to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Believe. You believe in your head, you believe in your heart, and you believe with your will. 
that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Look what he says in chapter 5, verse 1. He says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. Everyone that says that Jesus is the Christ. Now, some people think that when you see Jesus, that his first name's Jesus and his last name's Christ. That's not true. Uh, they didn't call him, hey, Mr. Christ, where do you want your mail to come to? No. Uh, it was a title that was assigned to him. That word Christ is a word that means Messiah. It means Savior. It means the anointed one. And so Jesus is the Savior. He is the Messiah. You say, well, if he's the Savior, what's he saving me from? He's saving me from my sins and from the penalty of my sins. You see, the Bible's clear, and I think everyone can understand this, is that God who created us is a holy God. And yet every one of us, every one of us has sinned. That just means we've messed up. We've done things that are wrong. And so we have a holy God, and then we have us, every one of us, who've done things wrong, and that causes a separation between us and this holy God. And this holy God is not only a God of mercy, but he's also a God of justice. And he says there has to be a payment for that sin, and the Bible says for the wages or the payment of sin is death. Death has to take place in order to forgive sins. That's why there was a sacrificial system where they'd sacrifice animals and say the blood would cover the sins. And this went on and on until finally he came to a point to where he sent his own son, Jesus Christ, to be that ultimate sacrifice. And he died for our sins. He lived that perfect, righteous life. And so once he died for our sins, he paved the way for us to come into a relationship with God. In fact, you look closely at what it says. Everyone who believes that Jesus is Christ has been born of God. And it means if you believe, if you accept Christ and say, I accept the fact that you died on the cross for my sins, I accept you as my Savior. When we say that, as soon as we say that, then we are born again. We are adopted into God's family. And he says, now you're a part of God's family. And so I'm a part of his family. Man, life is good. I am on the tracks. And this is how I get on the tracks. And for you today that's sitting here, if you have never made that decision, he said, Danny's first time I've really ever heard about the tracks, first time I ever heard about how to get on the tracks, you can get on the tracks today. <laughs> and and it, it just, it takes a time of you, just even today in this service, uh, of just praying to God and saying, I understand that you died for my sins, and I want to commit my life to you. And then you begin this incredible journey. Well, let's say once you get on the tracks, then, then what happens on there? So what happens that when I get on the tracks and I want to travel on the tracks? Or what happens if I've been on the track but I've gotten off the track and I want to get back on the track, so how do I do that? I am so glad you asked because that is the point we're going to talk about, and that's victorious living in Jesus. Victorious living in Jesus. I mean, once you get on the tracks, then he'll tell you, this is what we need to do. And look what he says in, verse, in chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever's been born of him. First thing he says, you got to love the Father. Man, once you get on the tracks, you love God. Why should I love God? Why should you love God? God is the one that knit you together in your mother's womb. God is the one who breathed life into you. God is the one who made you who you are. He is the one who gave you a purpose for life. He is the one who died for your sins. He is the one who's given you the power through the Holy Spirit to live the life here on earth. And one day when you die, you will spend eternity with him in heaven. Man, you just got to love the Father. But then he says, if you love the Father... He says, then you love whoever's been born uh, with him. Whoever's been born of the Father, you love them too. That means you love the other believers. And so we love the Father, we love other believers. And all throughout this book, if you just went home today and says, hey, I'm going to read the book of 1 John. It's only five chapters. You will see over and over and over again, he says, if you love God, love one another. Love God, love one another. It is all over it. But then, if you look in verse 3, it says, by this we know, or verse 2, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. So you obey his commandments. And it says they're not burdensome. Now when you start talking about obeying the commandments of the Bible, the very first thing people think of is God is such a killjoy. He's just going to take the buzz out of my life over here. No, not at all. God is the one who created you, and this God knows what is best for you, and he knows the path that is best, best for you to live. And all of us, all of us, will try to go our own way at times and go against what God's Word says. And I think 
probably every one of us could stand up and give a testimony of when I did that, there was usually collateral damage. There were mistakes that happened in my life, and it impacted negatively other people around me. And what God is saying is that I don't want you to have to go down that. He says, I've got a path for you that would bring not only abundant life to you, but it's also a life that would bring that joy, and it wouldn't have all the collateral damage that you have. Obey his commandments. So when you start getting on the track, just loving God, you're loving other believers, you are obeying God's commands, and then last of all, you are claiming victory over the world. Be an overcomer. Claim victory over the world. Be an overcomer. And I'm going to dig into this for just a moment. Verses 4 and 5. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Overcome. That word in the original language means to conquer. It means to conquer. It means that uh, it's an athletic term that means that you as an athlete, you have mastered your competition and you are reigning supreme. You are the champion. And we're going to break into that song. We are the champions. It's straight out of Scripture uh, over here. But that's what it means. It is we are the conquerors. And when he says you can overcome the world, he says you can conquer the world. You can overcome. You say, now how does all that work? Well, this works this way. First of all, it's because of at the resurrection, Jesus overcomes the world. At the resurrection, Jesus overcomes the world. This is why Easter is so important. This is why the Christian faith stands or falls on the resurrection. Because when Jesus died on a Friday, They took his body off the cross, they placed him in a tomb, and then on Sunday morning, when they came to visit the body, the tomb, the stone was rolled away, they looked in the tomb, he was gone. And they said, God has raised him from the dead. And then he appeared to the disciples and the 500 other people, and it was God that raised him from the dead. And when that happened, he conquered sin and he conquered death. He had overcome. He he had overcome the world. He had overcome sin, and he had overcome death. When I thought about that, I got brought to uh, memory a a verse in Scripture. It's Acts chapter 2. In Acts 2, 24, Peter is preaching at Pentecost, and look what he says. He says, God raised Jesus up, ending the pains of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by death. Now, focus on that for just a moment. God raised Jesus up, ending the pains of death. Because it was not possible for him to be held by death. Death's power was overcome by the resurrection, which means that believers no longer fear death. You've heard people say, well, death is the final word. No, Jesus is the final word. And so since he has the final word, he can take away the fear of death, he can ease the pain of death, and he can substitute that for peace. I had a real privilege this week of uh, spending time with a man who, uh, who, his son, two years ago, tragically died, college-age son, tragically died. And uh, he got into a long conversation to tell me a little bit about his journey he was going through there. And, uh, and as he walked me through it, he, he said, he says, you know how I'm coping with this grief? He says, I have been digging into the Bible, into God's Word. And he says, I've got to tell you, I'm blown away by how much God loves me and I am blown away by his sovereignty. And he says, I can just tell you that for me and for my wife, he said, we've got a real peace about this. And it's been a journey. But the reason that we have a peace is because of the love of God. And we're understanding more of who he is. And we're understanding his sovereignty. And we're understanding his love, his grace, his peace. And we're just wrapping into him. And he's wrapping his arms around us. And he said, this is making us to have a peace. I would have never expected. So what God's word says is true, and we live this out. At the resurrection, Jesus overcomes the world. And it's not just overcoming sin and death, but what it means is that he has conquered all the forces of this world that are opposed to God. He is greater than all the human systems of this world. He's greater than the arena where Satan attempts to wield his influence, to attack the church, to attack God's people. He has overcome all of these. So since God, Jesus has overcome all of these, how do you take that next step? This is this. We are overcomers through the power of Christ. 
we are overcomers through the power of Christ. Look what it says in verse 4. Verse 4 says this, for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. Everyone who's been born of God. How do you get on the tracks? Make a decision, receive Christ as Savior, says you're born again, you're adopted into his family. I'm riding on the tracks. Now, if I'm riding on the tracks and I'm born again, I'm a part of God's family, look what he says in verse 4. Everyone who's been born of God, that's me, overcomes the world. You overcome the world. Because of the power of Christ, he puts within you the power to overcome the world. It is a present tense. And when it's a present tense, it means it's continuous. You continually overcome the world. That's good news and bad news. I'll give you the bad news first. That means you're going to have continual struggles. But let me give you the good news. There'll be continuous victories. So there's never anywhere in here where it says, hey, once you get on the tracks, life is good. We're just cruising. There'll be no more struggles. Oh, no. <laughs> now, he says uh, you're constantly overcoming because there's constantly struggles. When we begin the walk of faith, this is when we enter into real-life competition. The decision to walk by faith puts a smack dab in the center of the ring where the contest immediately begins. Our faith pits us in a direct opposition to Satan and his plans and his powers, and it is on. And it is a continuous struggle, but it's also a continuous victory because of the power of Christ. And the power of Christ within you is greater than he who is in the world. And that is a promise that we want to hold on to. Jesus, meeting with his disciples that last day before he was arrested, said in John 16, 33, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have what? Overcome the world. I have overcome the world. Now I want you to write this sentence down, and that is the battle is not yet over, but it has already been decided. The battle is not yet over, but it has already been decided. Battle is not over, but it's already been decided. Jesus has overcome the world, and he's still overcoming the world, and he'll always be in a position where he's overcoming the world. But the battle's not over. You and me, we will still endure agony, pain, and distress in this world. But we're not dominated by this world because Jesus has overcome the world. And Satan is still going to use his instruments of this world to distract us, to deter us, to try to defeat us. But Jesus has overcome everything that Satan can throw at you. He has overcome the world. And the outcome has already been decided. We've already read the final chapter. God wins. And he said, I've already won this thing. We just got some skirmishes that are taking place over here. And so while these battles are going on, I got to tell you, you got an incredible resource over here. He says, I have overcome the world. And at times we struggle with the direction this world is going. And sometimes we feel helpless and hopeless. And then you add to that the challenges that we face, carrying the personal weight of raising kids, our stress at work, marriages that are struggling, financial strains, the juggling of school and jobs and hearts that are seeking meaning and purpose uh, in life, and we're seeking in all these wrong places. And in the midst of all of these challenges, the victory is already ours in Christ. This victory takes place and appropriated in our daily experiences as we exercise our faith. It says here in chapter 4, excuse me, verse 4. At the end, it says, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Our faith. You've got all these resources, folks, right at your fingertips. What our faith is is when our situation matches up with Jesus' resources. And it is as if you had a machine and it's got a plug on it and you just need to plug it into the power source. And once you plug it into the power source, then the machine starts working. That's what faith is. It is, I've got all that I need right here. I've got all the resources of Christ. And he says, take your situation, Danny. I want you to plug it into my resources, and you will overcome. You know why? Because Jesus says, I have already overcome the world. The conflict's not over, but the outcome is settled. Nothing in this world or nothing beyond can overcome the believer who is rooted in Jesus Christ. I, Howard Marshall, is a, a theologian, and he made a statement that I just love. It says this, Jesus Christ has defeated death, and anybody who can defeat death can defeat anything. Pretty good, pretty good. You know, how would you like to be in that contest over there? Say, hey, tell me what you can do. Well, I defeated death. What do you got? I think I'll put that back in my pocket. I don't think I got anything. That's about as good as it gets. That uh, You're throwing out that death card. You, you defeated it. 
I'm over. Isn't that great? If he can defeat death, you take whatever problem you've got, you take whatever situation you've got, you say, oh, I just think it's helpless, I think it's hopeless. Listen, if Jesus Christ defeated death, and that same power resides within you, he says, I can overcome that. I can overcome that. Now, if you ever follow track and field, there are a lot of different events that they have. One of the events they have is what is called the high jump. And what the high jump is, is that you take a bar and you, you place it over, uh, over here between two poles, and the goal of the athlete is to try to jump over that bar. And so what the athlete does is they step back a certain distance and they take off and they run as fast as they can. And as they get close to the bar, then they propel off of their leg and they try to leap over this bar and come out on the other side without knocking it over. World records cost about eight feet or so. So if you can jump out eight feet, then you can get over the bar. But there's a second exercise or relay that, or uh, event that they have, and it's called the pole vault. Very similar. Now, in the pole vault, they also uh, have got some uh, poles over here, and then they put across there a bar. And they put that bar, and the goal is for the person to go over that bar without knocking it over. The difference is they get a pole. All right? So now they got a pole. Now, what they do is about the same thing. They start running down here towards that, but then they take the pole and they stick it right here in this little pit, and when they hit it in there, all of a sudden, the power of that pole, along with their power, it propels them and puts them over the bar without knocking it over. Eight feet for the high jumper. The world record for a pole vaulter, 20 feet. 20 feet. So you can get two and a half more feet, or two and a half more times of height if you use the pole. High jumper in his own power. And in his own power, he can go over eight feet. A pole vaulter can go 20 feet. And the reason he can go 20 feet is because he's got one thing that the jumper doesn't, high jumper doesn't have. And what is that? It's called a what? That's great. It's just a little disappointing, but the 8 o'clock service was a little bit quicker on that than the 9.30. I cannot tell you how nervous that makes me for you for the rest of your day on there, but that's all right. All right. Okay. But you did get the correct answer. It was pole. Uh, and actually, one of the guys came up to me whose daughter pole vaulted, and I said, what was the difference? He said 12 feet. Uh, that's okay. I, that's good. I'm with you. So it's the only difference is he's got a pole. And because he's got that pole... He can lean into that pole, and with the power of that pole, along with his own power, he can go over two and a half times greater. And our walk with Christ, we are overcomers. Jesus would be like our pole. And he says, this is the resources that I have for you. I can provide these resources for you. And when we've got Christ, we can go down there, lean on that pole, and we can be overcomers on things we never thought we could overcome. If it's my own strength, I'm overcoming about eight feet worth. If I'm relying on Jesus' strength, I got 20 feet. Two and a half times of things that I can overcome. When I thought about that illustration, it also got me to think about how many people that I have talked to that said, well, I just think Christianity is a crutch. I just think it's a crutch. You know, go through tough times, just lean on a crutch. It got me thinking, you know, what is a crutch for? A crutch is when you're overwhelmed with something. It's just knocked you off your feet, and you're just trying to hang in there, and so you've got this crutch that you want to hold on to. But you know, that's not the Christianity that I read about in Scripture. What I read about in Scripture is not a crutch to be overwhelmed. It's a pole to overcome. And what it means is I see more Christianity more as I've got this pole and I've got the resources of Christ and I don't care what comes into my life. It may seem that it's going to be overwhelming, but because of the power of Christ, I can soar over that. I can overcome that. I can conquer that. And the reason I can do that is not because Danny Wood's great. It's because the power of Christ is great. And because he who is in me, the power of God, is greater than he who is in the world. Now, last point is this. Your eternal destiny is at stake. Your eternal destiny is at stake. Verses 11 and 12. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. At British Airways flight 3271, guess what they did? They refueled and they took off again. 
So after their involuntary stopover in Edinburgh, they loaded up and they got them back. You know, when it's an airplane, you can eventually get to your destination. But when your eternity is at stake, you want to make sure you have the right guidance because there is no rerouting after death. The decisions that you make today while you're alive will determine your eternal destination. And this is why Easter is so important. Is because everything stand, rises or stands, rises or falls on the resurrection. And the fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead proved that he had conquered sin and he had conquered death and gives every one of us an opportunity to come in a right relationship with him and to know that we'll spend eternity with God when we die. But if we reject that, and decide not to get on the tracks, to stay off the tracks, then when we die, we spend eternity separated from him. Your destiny is at stake. And so it's my prayer that this Easter, you will realize the love of God, realize what he's done through his son, Jesus Christ, the price that has been paid, the opportunity that is offered to you, and that today, if you've never made that decision, to say, I want to get my life on the tracks, and I want to follow him. Let me lead us in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this day. And we pray right now and during these next few moments that you'll be speaking to the hearts of those who have never made decisions for you. And that today could be their day to where they pray, they ask you to come into their heart, and they begin this incredible journey. We thank you that you are the overcomer. We thank you that you have overcome sin, you've overcome death, and you have given us the opportunity to come into a right relationship with God. We thank you that by making that decision, you adopt us, you bring us into your family, and that we're a part of, uh, of the family of God. And with that comes all the power and all the resources and all the love and all the forgiveness and all the mercy, everything that comes with being in your family and being a joint heir with Christ. Lord, we love you. We thank you for Easter. We thank you for the truth of the resurrection. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.